뒤쪽에 있는 이벤트 부스 가시면 선물과 바꿔드리도록 하겠습니다. 부스로 가시면 여러분들에게 어, 나온 해당 사... 
Good afternoon. From now on, let us begin the 14th Busan International Medical Tourism Convention lecture session. We are now celebrating the beginning of autumn in Korea, and today is the first day of October. And today we are having the 14th session or event of the IMTC, and how can we not have a lecture session for this event? We have invited top-notch physicians for this. I am MC Kang Yun Ha from Hani Medical. Thank you. Today we will have six renowned doctors' presentation in Busan from University Hospital and directors of famous hospitals in Busan. We have prepared this lecture session so that you can get easy to understand information. So please be with us until the very end and I hope you find the session meaningful. So today's first presentation is from Professor Yoon Myung Hee. He? Professor Yoon Myung Hee graduated from Busan University Medical School and has conducted a different academic activities and currently serving as the professor at the Hepato Biliary and Pancreatic Development. Professor Yoon's presentation is titled Alcohol, Fatty Liver and Liver Cancer. Please welcome Professor Yoon Myung Hee with a big round of applause. Good afternoon. My name is Professor Yoon Myung Hee from Busan National University Hospital. My topic today is alcohol, fatty liver, and liver cancer. I have safety distance, so let me take off my mask as I deliver my presentation. As you can see from this picture, I can see who uh, myself in the picture it looks like that I'm finding I'm trying to find out who's enjoying alcohol. I do liver transplant and this is job I do at my hospital. The liver at the bottom is the healthy liver to be transplanted. One liver, we have one liver and the doctor divides it into left part and right part. This young man in his 20s is donating part of his liver to his father and the remaining part is very healthy. I'm a doctor who treats liver and sometimes I when I look at the where the liver is situated, this is where the liver is sitting on. I look at its position and its function as well. And so I think that uh, how can I compare the livers to how our society works? As you can see, I want you to think about for a second. What role does a liver play if it's like uh, our society? I think like this. There's an immigration stand. If you are arriving at Korea from foreign countries, there will be many people trying to enter Korea and Maybe some of them may be carrying something harmful to Korea or the COVID-19 virus when they arrive at Korea or probably they could be terrorists. So they should be screened before entering Korea. Then everybody... We are connected to our mother uh, in the womb and we grow into adults so we our body whether it's food or water whatever we intake healthy food vitamins 
Some are taken in, some are took, uh, taken in through veins or through biblical cord or through liver before they are in, uh, taken into our body. Uh, in conclusion, water and nutrition cannot enter our body without passing through liver. So as a doctor who treats liver, I like to compare uh, liver to our society. So that, in that sense, liver uh, plays the role uh, of an immigration office. When we talk about liver, fatty liver, fatty liver, then what happens if I have fatty liver? Then it appears there's nothing to think about. Then how much of a share a li uh, does a liver take up in our body? It takes up about 2 to 3 percent of our body mass. Sometimes we say jokingly, a man of big liver. That means if you if you weigh 70 kilos, kilograms, then your liver will weigh about 2 kilograms. And 2 times that, the liver should weigh 1400 grams. But a man with bigger liver, then it comes to 2000 grams. So then he may be a man with big liver. Then how much alcohol uh, should be contained in the liver if we uh, confirm that he has a, a alcoholic li uh, fatty liver? So how can we diagnose that a man has the fatty liver? Maybe you haven't heard the clear-cut diagnosis. Uh, let me show you uh, different types of fatty livers. This is the liver from a person in their 20s. And the liver uh, has underwent, undergone surgery for some reasons. This is fatty liver. Even though he is in his 20s, he has fatty liver. And so it looks, looks pretty in pink, but you can see the white spots in the ultrasound wave. So he is diagnosed with uh, fatty liver. And as a surgeon who treats liver, this liver is the edge of the liver uh, is round and blunt. But if comparing it with the healthy liver, the one that was transpa uh, transplanted, the edge were not was not blunt and it was relatively thin. And this is the liver from a person in his forties. Some of you must be in your forties. And as with the age, liver turns changes color as we get older. Of course, this liver has some inflammation and has some tissue uh, issues, but it has liver, and so it has some fibers around it. And this is a liver uh, from a person in their 60s. It has much more liver uh, fat and fibers. It's observed. So this is early stage of liver sclerosis. And liver from a person in his 80s. And just like our skin, this liver has aged and the state of this liver looks like, exactly like it's, this is a liver from a person in their 80s. Then what happened to this? Then. So what happens if a liver is fatty? That's the story that I'll be talking about today. The difference between healthy and fatty liver is may not be detected in your everyday life. But as a person like me who cuts liver, we know the consequences. The, this red liver is healthy one and on the bottom, which has fat. The yellow one is fatty liver. For a doctor like me who cuts liver, when we look at, we see the clear results when we see how they recover. So I cut the liver and 
then we use the term restoration the process of a liver that recovers our body is very quick to respond because we are very healthy just after 15 days the healthy liver after being cut the area 95 or the percent air cut area cut recovered after 15 days however the fatty liver especially the liver with high volume of fat then af even after 15 days the recovery process takes much longer time so when you have a fatty liver when it's very important that you be very careful in cutting the deciding the part to be cut the standard to cut the liver uh, is like this on this slide but when you but for you if you have experience just like fatigue in your everyday life or if you feel that you have some side effects from the malfunction of liver if you feel that or sense that then that's the symptom of the fatty liver it's not necessarily a, a serious disease the liver doesn't respond in that way it's not a very sensitive organ so this liver is a very healthy one and we cut this and transplant it to his ailing father but before that we conducted the liver biopsy to see how much fat it has in this part in the yellow circle when it's about the fatty liver was less than 5% so we conducted the transplant but on the bottom the yellow this part in the yellow circle and we check the fatty liver level through biopsy then these two, the result from these two livers let me show you so uh, just think about since you heard my presentation so this person was sadly had an accident and carried to our ER in his studies but sadly he went brain dead and but thankfully he donated his organs so many people received his organs and in my department he because he donated his liver person on the waiting list in my hospital received uh, prepared for the surgery and this is his liver and the liver we conducted biopsy on this liver from your naked eye how does it look after tissue biopsy the fatty liver was 70% from the photo in the previous page this liver is very blunt and has white fibers and pink a little pink but has sh some different shapes so this liver was 70 percent fat so was determined unfit for transplant so we thanked him and we expressed our mourn and finished the surgery after I finish my presentation then you may think that you wanna have a cup of a cool a bottle of cool beer so maybe you may you, know, you maybe think that I should have some soju after this presentation that's how we are living with alcoholic beverages when we have some couple meeting we after about three or four hours of tea time sometimes we uh, say to each other we can remain sober and talk to each other uh, if we don't drink alcohol when we talk about alcohol in the ER uh, in the surgery room we sometimes hear uh, a, a patient's wife also sometimes uh, says to us 
tell my husband that alcohol is very bad to his health. We all know that very well what impact alcohol has on our body. But for us, we don't know how, we know how to handle alcohol, but we just live exposed to it. But I hope that after my presentation, you become more able to handle the alcohols by yourself. This is an article from a newspaper a few years back. The WHO, this is data from WHO. From 15, it was a study conducted from 2015 to 2017 in Korea, China, and Japan. The alcohol consumption per person, the darker color is the consumption by male, and the lighter one is for women every, on a yearly basis. There are 365 days per year, and the number of cans consumed was, uh, this, the volume was 550 cc. The normal can of beer comes in 330 cc, but uh, this is based on 550 cc. Per year, every Male consumes uh, an, an average of 20 50 cans of beer, but for Korean people, they consume 668 cans of beer per year. That comes to at least 1.8 cans every day, almost two cans every day. It's a, such a high volume, and Korea was ranked the first. So that's how much we consume, how much of beer we consume every year. Everyone, we cannot live without alcohol. We know that. This is the data from Korea's Health Corporation. For the normal liver, if you drink, sometimes the fatty liver comes to 100%, up to 100%, and about 35% has the liver inflammation, and about 20% experience hepatocirrhosis. This is the data from the National Health Corporation. Actually, this is a person who visited our uh, my hospital. He consumed a half a bottle of soju every day. You may think this is not a much big deal. A cup of soju while uh, he had meals. Sometimes they begin this from their 30s. But the average uh, life expectancy of Korean people is 50, 50 years then, and he drank soju for 10 years. This is the person in his 50s, and he began drinking early in his life from his from 30 years of age. He had SI, esophageal variceal bleeding, so it was hard to stop bleeding so he, and he also had hepatic encephalopathy all vein in his body had bleeding and his blood pressure dropped so he was in a very critical state and visited ER but luckily there was a person who was brain dead and had the liver from the person, from that brain dead person. So let's say that you consume half a cup of soju every day. It has at least 20 or 30 grams of alcohol uh, for over 10 years. Then this is the condition of the liver. This is a very serious state of alcohol liver. But luckily, he received the donated liver. He was so lucky to have the liver transplant and recovered after that. But seven years after the surgery, today, does he drink soju? He drinks soju for outpatient department. I told him that you have been saved three times, your life, 
the donated person's life and your new life, but he still drinks. That's how difficult it is to quit drinking. So anyway, this is the data from the National Health Portal. A cup of soju has three, 10 grams of alcohol. If we consume 60 grams of alcohol or higher a day, then you are very likely to have liver diseases. It, might, it may look like a one glass, but if you consume this on a daily basis, you should remember that you are drinking a cup of soju every day. This will help you get the perspective. How much of alcohol have I consumed my entire life? For a male, you drank 3.3.5 bottle of soju per week, but it comes to 3.5 bottles of soju per week. You may drink three cans of beer, then the 10 cans is, uh, are dangerous uh, if you drink it uh, per week. If you, uh, and for women as well, if you drink 7 cans of beer, then you will be likely to be in the waiting list for liver transplant. In my hospital, there, uh, there's a woman in her 40s uh, waiting for the liver donation. She hasn't drink, drank alcohol as much as she used to, but she had a liver sclerosis after three years, and her husband is donating the liver. This is the reality. So, as I told you, alcohol liver leads to fatty liver, fatty hepatitis, and alcoholic liver sclerosis. Type B, Type C, hepatitis is on the in increase, but alcohol, fatty liver is on the rise. Then what? And people will say, what's the symptoms? But what's important is the fatty liver doesn't have specific symptoms. That's why we keep drinking soju or alcoholic beverage. If you have fatty liver, you don't sense the symptoms. Then. What should you do? Let me tell you from the next slide. If you have fatty liver, then you should feel something. You may feel fatigue or some feel some heat. But um, since you are busy with your work or every life, they don't come to hospital. But fatty acid, alcoholic fatty acid, people with fat. Uh, Alcoholic liver as liver come to hospital and they undergo tissue examination and the results are like this. The final results of the liver exa uh, ex examination, it was confirmed that this person uh, was diagnosed with liver cancer. The cancerous cells were confirmed in the liver. Even without the liver sclerosis, this is the li liver cancer from alcohol consumption, the li liver right hepatectomy and liver left hepatectomy. You may have liver cancer like this, not just from alcohol consumption, but alcohol, if you're exposed to alcohol, this is the state of the liver who are exposed to liver. Can we prevent this by quitting alcohol? Then you, then you can pre prevent fatty liver. Yes, you can. But after that, you may have additional treatment. But quitting smoking is something that you choose, something that you can choose to do. And after I after my presentation, I think I should have a cup of green tea rather than beer. So what's important is the regular management. Every morning when you wake up, the first thing in the morning, mirror, mirror to eye, look healthy. Stick out your tongues and 
check if your tongue is wet and it has healthy tone or healthy colors and sometimes check the color of your urine and change your uh, and check your body weight change and measure your blood pressure everywhere you go there are many blood pressure devices then make sure that you measure your blood pressure it's very important to follow your blood pressure and also be more sensitive to the alert either through text message or mails or uh, you can also undergo ultrasound examination or blood tests and then you can have some more uh, precision examinations livers are not sensitive it's very slow to respond so sometimes but it has some advantages because it does not reject external organs after trans transplant so it, liver is a good li, is a good organ to be transplanted but sometimes it's good not to be so sensitive so when I think uh, I think uh, I feel healthier uh, when liver becomes healthier thank you for your patience thank you Thank you, Professor Yun Myung Hee, listening to your presentation. So I was thinking that I should get half a cup of beer, but now I think I should uh, have a cup a cup of green tea. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Please give her a warm round of applause. Thank you. How was the first presentation? It was about liver. It, was it meaningful for you? Next, moving on, let's invite our second renowned doctor. Second presenter is Mr. Park Jong Sung, professor of Tonghua University Hospital. I would like to invite Professor Park Jong Sung onto the stage. Professor Park Jong Sung completed majored in internal medicine at Tonga University, worked as assistant professor at Severance Hospital Department of Cardiology, and now works in Tonga University Hospital Department of Internal Medicine. The title of presentation today is "Is Your Heart Healthy?" So the floor is yours. Thank you for your introduction. I am currently at Tonga University Hospital and I'm in charge of Department of Cardiology. So the field I majored in is arrhythmia. And arrhythmia may lead to coma and death, so it's very serious disease. Whenever I meet with patients at hospital, I always explain to uh, my patients about the arrhythmia, but it's not easy to understand. So I think it would be very difficult for you to understand after just 30 minutes of presentation, but I'll tell you how we can find symptoms of arrhythmia at an early stage and help you find high-risk patients around you so that you can share information with them about arrhythmia. Arrhythmia develops in our heart. As you may well know, heart is an organ that serves as an engine of our body. It sends blood throughout, circulates blood throughout our body. I'm in my 50s now, and when I come walk up the stairs, I run out of my breath, but I wasn't like so in my 20s. So as I age, the functionality of our heart decreases, and the engine power also decreases. And the electric circuit, the arteries in our heart also weaken. 
In order to make the engine work, as you can see, there is a very sophisticated circuit. Just like this circuit, in our heart, there is a pump, the organ that works as a hump, pump. And we also have a very sophisticated system, just like this electric circuit. And when we age, the circuit may break down, and that's when arrhythmia develop. Whether you have a disease in heart or not, whether you have strong engine or not, as you age, when these electric circuits break down, then arrhythmia may develop. Basically, when we test our heart Beat, we see the regularity of our heartbeats. As a doctor, I see the principle that the heart beats regularly. I get a little bit nervous because all of you are watching me, so my heart beats very fast. But basically, in principle, my heart should beat regularly. So that's the first principle. And second, the number of heartbeats, when you measure that heartbeat, it, within one minute, it should be 50 to 100 times. Younger people may have faster heartbeat, but for our audience here, I guess it will be around 50 to 100. So that's the second rule, second principle. So one heartbeat should be regular and second the rate heart rate should be 50 to 100 per minute so that's the basic two rules of heartbeats when you have irregular heartbeat or when your heart rate is lower than 50 or higher than 100 then that can be the signal of arrhythmia so you need to remember these two rules in order to see whether there is abnormal symptoms in your body or whether you have arrhythmia. We cannot see how our heart beats, so we need to use specific medical devices in order to measure heartbeats. So to measure your heartbeats, you can measure your pulse by putting fingers on your wrist. So, just like the photo on the picture, let's measure your pulse of your left wrist by using your right fingers. You can feel your pulse by putting fingers on it. So even though the strength of that pulse may differ from right to left, if you didn't get any surgery, then you will be able to find your uh, pulse. So after feeling your pulse, you should see whether that pulse is regular. So rule number one was that heartbeats regularly, so the pulse should be regular. So when you measure it, it should have a regular rhythm. However, when the heart beats irregularly and the pulse is irregular, just like the red line, when the pulse skips a certain rhythm, then it's abnormal. The pulse should be regular, as I mentioned, but if the pulse has in a regular rhythm, just like the red one, you should know that there is something wrong. And it can be a signal that you have arrhythmia. So see and check whether you have irregular pulse. And as I mentioned, a fast pulse or low pulse is problematic, but uh, number one, if that pulse is irregular, that can be an, an abnormal signal. And second rule, let's check for the sec rule number two. As mentioned, the pulse should, uh, the heart should beat around 550 to 100 times per minute. So let's measure it. 
Let's measure your impulse. I set the clock at one minute. So let's take one minute to measure the pulse. So please count how many times your heart or you have pulse at your wrist. One, two, three, four. You should count. The Cardiology Doctor Association of Korea recommend to measure the pulse with to see whether it is lower than 50 or to see whether it is irregular. So that's recommended to all the elderly people. And if you are 65 and above, you should visit hospital regularly to check for a checkup, whether you have disease or not. So arrhythmia can develop at a early stage and at an early age. So for all people, we recommend to measure the pulse. So one minute has passed. How was it? Could you check number uh, rule number one and two? If it is OK, then you are healthy. You have a healthy heart. I have emphasized before that whenever I see patients for cardiac disease or when I give lectures related to heart health. So I always mention these two rules. Number one, regularity, and second, the heart rate. And if you have abnormal symptoms on these two rules, then you have an, a symptom of arrhythmia. If you have fast heartbeat or too slow heartbeat, it's a signal that you have may have arrhythmia. So some types of arrhythmia is quirky because on and someday your heart may beat very regularly, but on some other day your heart may beat irregularly. So that can be arrhythmia too. And I've mentioned about irregular pulse that can be beat fast while being irregular, or it can beat slow while being irregular. So it can, the symptoms may differ. So as I mentioned, please measure your pulse by putting fingers on your wrist. And when you find out some irregular signals, then you should see a doctor to, for a quick checkup. So as mentioned, the pulse should have regular rhythm, just like the green line, and should beat around 50 to 100 times per minute. But let's see the blue line. So the rhythm, the heart rate, the pulse rate isn't that high, but the blue person skips certain rhythm. And the patients say that my pulse skips a bit once in a while. And they mention that my heart jumps at a throat or gives a throat, just like having a fire on my house or forgot to turn off the gas oven. And by so that person may get surprised and her or his heartbeat may skip a bit. So they mention that they feel that symptoms quite re uh, frequently. The fact that the heart gives this kind of signal is that the heart is under stress. When the heart gets stressed, then it may develop some symptoms. So these kind of abnormal symptoms may develop into vomiting or passing out. So as mentioned, healthy heart beats like the green one. But for some people, heart beats very fast, just like the red line. But you can see the second red line, the pulse beats regularly, but very, very fast. And sometimes the heart rhythm changes into slower pace and then again at a faster pace. And the patients say to me that the heart beats too fast. And if that heart 
beats too fast, then you get very dizzy and you burn out of breath. And that's why patients come to see me. And if you have these kind of symptoms and you have a high possibility of having arrhythmia, or if your heart beats fast, it's because you, get, you got stressed. So once again, if you have irregular pulse, then you should visit a hospital. So check, in order to test for arrhythmia, you should measure your pulse, that's number one. And some, on some day, it may be okay, but on some other day, do you have some irregular symptoms. So the same goes for me. And you may think that on a, in a new regular day, you want to see a doctor, but you should wait for several months to see the doctor, so you measure it another day, and then it's okay. So when you feel some irregularity, you should visit the hospital close to you. If it is not a university hospital, then it's okay. If you have irregular system, you should go to your closer hospital because you need to prove that you have some irregularity to that doctor. So in order for us as a doctors to diagnose arrhythmia, we should check that irregularity. So when you have symptoms, you should visit uh, the hospital right away. That's the, that's the most important thing that you should do. Then let's say your heart beats really fast, and then as mentioned, the rhythm may change. But there's a, some people that heart stops to beat. It's like a temporary or short heart attack. There was a elderly female patient that visited me and after beating having a fast heartbeat and she her heart stopped beating so she passed out for a minute because of a heart attack and i asked her why and she mentioned that when she got stressed then she had really fast heartbeat and when the heart stops then she passes out due to heart attack. And some say patient mentioned that things look fuzzy after having fast heartbeat and things become pitch black. And for young patients, I did some surgery for a young person. He had a traffic accident due to heart attack, so it's very serious. And yesterday I treated an old female patient and she got a heart attack on the road so it's very very dangerous so but for some people they don't come to the hospital and the doctor cannot find whether he or she has symptoms or cardiac disease or not because at the time they visit the hospital they don't have any symptoms so when you have symptoms go see a doctor so arrhythmia, this kind of this type of arrhythmia is the most dangerous one because you get a short heart attack for a temporary while, then it may lead to another dangerous accident. So the green line again is a healthy heart, and the second uh, purple line it's very very slow. So it's uh, the opposite of the formal case. So. This person has slow heartbeat, so this person has low energy. Regular, for a healthy person, it, one should have at least 50 times of pulse a month. But for this purple patient, it is difficult for him to lift heavy things or walk upstairs. And then the patient, when this patient will come visit me, and they mention that it's very difficult to do anything or come up, uh, walk up the stairs because he runs out or she runs out of breath. And they say that it gets dizzy. So as you can see, there are various symptoms of arrhythmia. When you have heart disease that has strong symptoms, then it is very easy to diagnose. But in case of arrhythmia, it is very difficult to diagnose because patients lose the track of that symptoms. And 
when you have irregular heartbeat or some uh, other abnormal symptoms in your pulse, then you should let young per people or young person around you to measure your pulse instead. And then please deliberate your symptoms in detail to the doctor. That's why patients come to my office after visiting several hospitals. Arrhythmia patients go to wrong hospital because they pass out, they go to some neural department of the hospital, or as one feels difficult to breathe, he may go to see check her lung. But all these are because of arrhythmia. After having a heart attack, they visit the cardiology department. After getting treated, one gets healthy. So when a non-elderly feels very fast heartbeat, some doctor give wrong diagnosis and say that one she or he has Alzheimer's disease. It's not because of Alzheimer or Parkinson's, it's because of arrhythmia. So after measuring your pulse, pulse, arrhythmia have irregularity, as I mentioned, and you, your symptoms may disappear after visiting the hospital. And I always recommend my nurses to accept arrhythmia patients to check for symptoms immediately, but usually patients have to wait for several months. When you have symptoms, as mentioned, please visit the nearest hospital close to you. Because when you visit after the symptom get goes away, then I may think that you don't have any anything wrong. If the checkup on that day comes out to be okay, then I cannot diagnose to that you have arrhythmia. So when you run out of breath and you have irregular pulse, then visit a hospital and show to the doctor before that irregular symptoms go away. So when you visit the hospital, the doctor may recommend you to do that. It takes only one minute to do that checkup. It costs only 1,000 to 2,001. So if you do that checkup, ECG checkup, on the day you have symptoms, then the diagnosis can be very accurate and we can treat you to live a healthy life. So please visit the nearest hospital when you have symptoms and I recommend you to take ECG checkup on that day. So whenever I give cardiology lecture to my students, I may sure to let them understand that to they should say to their patients to let uh, to make them check their pulse and visit the closest hospital and you should capture that evidence capture that proof of that abnormal symptoms there are various causes of arrhythmia so Professor Yoon mentioned cigarette and alcohol are causes of liver disease, and the same goes for arrhythmia. So the biggest cause is because of aging. So many elderly people visit my hospital. If young people find out to have arrhythmia, it's because of stress mainly. I'm in, the, in my 50s, so it can be because of stress or because of aging. But people like you, all of you, then it can be because of aging. We cannot pinpoint the age where arrhythmia develops frequently, but as you age, you should check regularly on a day-to-day -day basis to find out the symptoms. So arrhythmia get affected by the age a lot. So when you get stressed, your heart beats fast. So me too, before coming up the stage, I got really, really nervous and my heart beat 
really, really fast. Yesterday before coming here, and I said to my professor that my heart beats really fast. And I developed some symptoms related to arrhythmia. And it was because of stress. And that arrhythmia symptoms was because of stress. And after checking the stress, that symptoms, I got more stressed. Well, that was my student. I prescribed medicine to lower the heartbeat, and it was it became okay. Caffeine, coffee, cigarette, or alcohol may affect this kind of symptom. And as for arrhythmia, if you drink, it is very difficult to control. So. For my patients, I always say to quit drinking. And arrhythmia gets affected by mental and physical stress. For all cardiac diseases, arrhythmia gets affected by stress the most. When uh, someone close to you passes away, or after an earthquake or other natural disasters, people visit the cardiology department very after that incident. So this kind of stress influenced the development of arrhythmia. After doing exercise, you need to sleep well, because after exercise, if you don't sleep well, then it is very difficult to regulate arrhythmia. So for, for those cardiac disease patients, you are you may have already visited the hospital, so we can treat you. But for those who didn't visit the hospital because of this, then it is very difficult to find out. But for cardiac disease patients, they get stressed because of their disease. So again, arrhythmia may develop. And another major reason that I mentioned was aging. So. In order to lower the symptoms, you need to exercise regularly. The, as for the treatment, there can be many. This is very field-specific method. You can, we can eradicate some of the causes in our body. So if you visit the doctor, then we can treat you. As you can see, we have these good treatments at hand. But the reason why we cannot treat you and make you healthy is because you don't visit the hospital when you have symptoms. If you don't measure your pulse, then you cannot, uh, you cannot tell whether that's because of stress or that's because of arrhythmia. So you should regularly check your pulse. So the Doctors Association of Cardiology always recommend people from age 60 to above to check their pulse regularly. When a, when a person gets older, this is an x-ray photo. The left photo, x-ray photo, is from a young, healthy male. The black part is heart. As you can see, the white part is, as you can see, is very small. But when one gets older, it gets bloated. So the left side is a healthy heart, and right side is an aged heart. If the hearts get bigger, then you have a high possibility of arrhythmia. And again, if you have arrhythmia, then you get older fast. You age fast. So the arrhythmia itself can be understood as a symptom of aging. But if arrhythmia develops, then it may accelerate aging of the heart. So whenever you have abnormal symptoms, you should go visit the hospital. Because it may lead to another serious accident that, as I mentioned before, even though you may pass out, you may have a coma for a while, it may not be because of your brain or neural issues. It can be because of arrhythmia. Let's see the 
picture on the slide, it's atrial fibrillation. As you can see, the heart beats irregularly and it has that vibration. This is because of aging. And this symptom is called atrial fibrillation and it leads to various complications, so it's a bad case. The auxiliary pump of the heart paralyzed and the auxiliary pump is affected by aging, so it may stop earlier than uh, expected. So if one gets like 100 years old, the heart major pump of the heart may stop and auxiliary pump as well. And uh, we say that that person die. But in some cases, at an earlier age than 100, auxiliary pump may stop. Then we will have to do a surgery because it is very difficult to live a healthy life. And a blood clot may develop in the heart because of the paralyzed auxiliary pump. Could you click the left side and right side? Then you can see the normal heart on the left, and you have heart with atrial fibrillation, which is an arrhythmia that developed for an older per person. So if you see the right image, then you can see that it's wrong. And there are some people who cannot find any abnormal symptoms, even though he or she may have atrial fibrillation. So among all the patients that come to my hospital, 1,200 to 300 aged uh, elderly suffer from uh, atrial fibrillation. So as mentioned, they may lead to cardiac blood clots, and that may lead to another serious disease. And I introduced to you about atrial fibrillation, which may lead to cerebral infraction. So all the symptoms may develop for one person. So check your pulse regularly. It should be regular, and it should be around 50 to 100 per month uh, per minute. And if it is too fast or too slow, go visit the hospital near you and visit the doctor. And if the doctors say that it's arrhythmia, then go to arrhythmia expert. If you get diagnosed, then you can live a healthy life. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Professor Park introduce us to arrhythmia. You've mentioned to capture the uh, crime on the crime site. Thank you for your presentation related to arrhythmia. Please give him a big round of applause. So self-diagnosis is important, as you mentioned. So when you have time, please check whether your pulse beats at 50 to 100 per month. Let's move on. Let's move on to the next presentation. For this presentation, I'd like to invite President Park won from Park won Hospital. Dr. Park won graduated from Busan National University Hospital and served as the spinal department professor and also serves as the committee member of the Health Insurance Review and Deliberation Service. Currently, he is serving as the president of the Park Won-uk Hospital, treating patients with spinal diseases. His title is Spine Disease for Surgery and Disease for Procedure. Good afternoon. I've been treating spine diseases for more than 30 years now. And Today, there are many diseases related to spine. So I have treated virtually all diseases related to spine. Today, you may be wondering, should I get a procedure or should I get a surgery? There are so many things to explain, but I like to focus on something important. 
First is preservatory treatment. That is the procedures that does not involve surgery. And so I like to talk about basic treatments. All disease use drugs and spine also use drugs. Anti-inflammatory, analgetic drug, muscle relaxant. These are drugs used for spine. Unlike internal medicines, there are not many drugs for spines. But most of the drugs drugs don't solve spine diseases except for osteoporosis. So you get drugs and medication for spine, but they are most mostly painkillers, not drugs. So these are all just basic auxiliary drugs. These are the normal treatment that you get, such as stegognosis or slip disc, slip disc. But it does not. It is not recommended for sprain or bone fracture. Then the traction will worsen the conditions. So. If you have pain, that then you don't want to have this treatment. This is the spine MT that we have in our hospital, and also uh, standing on your feet. Not exactly as horizontal as this, but this procedure is good. Is good for stegognosis, spinal or slip disc. But uh, if you have bone fracture, it's not recommended, and hot pack as well. Something hot helps blood circulation, but for inflammation, then if you increase the temperature, then the virus will proliferate, and it may cause complications. So it's not recommended for inflammation. So basically, for sprain. For the first three days, cold pack is recommended, and then hot pack. This is ultra wave, and ultra wave increases the heat in the deep tissue. But so for virus infection or after surgery, ultra wave is not recommended. And ACE for surgery after surgery or procedure we give patients the ACE patients need to have those ACE for about 3 months after having undergoing screw procedures but mostly 6 weeks it's also available on the internet this is air traction ACE and, but this is not recommended for bone fracture or sprain because it may worsen the conditions. And this is hot bed. Hot bed warms you and also comes with massage functions. But it's not recommended if you have very weak bones. And it's not recommended for virus infections either and extra ESWT it does not have come with injury and it eases the pains it's good for frozen shoulder plantar fasces so it's good for the pains after surgery now the needle treatments the, this is TPI. This is applied for myofascial pain syndrome. But basically, when you have muscle pain uh, after s sitting on a on one position for a long time, then the TPI can be recommended by applying local anesthesia. And this is IMS, which is applied for myofascial pain syndrome. And this is epidural block. This is good for stegognosis and dysics. And it anesthetizes the, the local region and reduces the nerve stimuli.
and it's applied for stegonosis and disc hermitation but for back pain this needle does not help very much this is caudal block it's also applied for stegonosis and the prolotherapy injecting 20% glucose to cause the inflammation to stiffen the tissue to control the pain and now it's now getting some prof some uh, a little professional and this is the facet joint needle you may have pain when you twist your back to the right or to the left and this black point is where you get the facet joint needle and for serious facet joint then you may want to get a surgery this is also sacroiliac needle is applied for sacroiliac sacroiliac joint syndrome and also for butt lock and groin these are all the simple needle treatments and this is also stegonose um, rubber block which is good for stegonosis and you have some pain in your leg you need to have CT or MRI to get those treatment it comes with steroid or anti-inflammant now the procedures for spine this is lumbar nucleoplasty the sleep discs this is done after anesthetizing the local area on the area with the red arrow and the cadete is inserted and as you can see in the lower left then the disc decreases and for this one is lumbar nucleoplasty then the disc has been slipped and so in this case lumbar nucleoplasty is recommended but as you can see on the left photo then if you have sequestrated discs then this procedure may not help so you want to get surgery and also for neck you can apply cervical nucleoplasty on your neck you may fear this procedure but for professionals if you have the stegonosis on, on the red arrow then you may get this treatment and also neuroplasty you can apply this to your neck or to the spine which are most common if you have back pain or neck pain there are so many people with pains like that about 80 percent of people have that pain at least once in their life so there are many treatments for local anesthesia and insert cadefi and stegonosis and sleep disc it takes about 10 minutes and if it works well then patients can forget about the pain right after the procedure but when the nerves are damaged can you see the white area on the but on the right uh, you see the white areas this means that, that the nerves are dead so in this case cervical neuroplasty must not be conducted only surgery is recommended these are the good cases for neuroplasty And these are cases that requires surgery, the serious disc, slip disc. Then you need to go undergo surgery. The actual image, you, it's not quite normal, but it has relevant, a relatively smaller space for surgery. So well, left requires surgery and right requires procedure. Uh, pr surgery and the left requires procedure this is balloon neurolysis neuroplasty the balloon is inflated and inserted to ease the stegonosis
the balloon secures the space and then the balloon is removed with the kateti this is the video clip from the actual surgery the local anesthesia and relatively thick, thick needle is inserted and the kateti is inserted into the spines so then the patient we keep talking to patients does it hurt or where do you have pain some the patients uh, if the patients has Anesthesia, then the patients may not feel the pain, but it could be dangerous. This is IDET disc tattoo, which is usually applied for back pain. There are so many people with back pain. The right, top right, you can see the black area. On the top right photo, if you have that symptoms, then it hurts, especially when you sit on the floor or on the web, on the bed. That means you have the internal disc derangement. And top bottom right is a foreign doctor who visited my clinic to see my operation. On the right, the black area, uh, this is the case that's suitable for ID, ID disc kit too. Then if it doesn't work, then we have invasive operation. And you should have this symptom for more than six months before getting the live permission from the Ministry of Health. This is also the balloon urolysis. Because of the compression fracture, then the balloon is inserted and, and then you can conduct vertebroplasty. It requires one day of hospitalization and sometimes local anesthesia is just enough. Now the operation. You, most of you don't like to have operation, but sometimes operation is inevitable. First, the removal of the endoscopic disc. This is endoscopic lumbar disectomy. The disc is removed. Now, after and before the operation, the disc had uh, have been removed. And in this case, the disc has slipped, so it requires operation. And for stegonosis, it's different from the spinal stegonosis. You don't have symptoms if you sit still or lie still. It doesn't cause pains, but the main symptoms of stegonosis is the pain when you walk, like a pain on in, in your leg. So if you have pain or back pain, then it must not be stegonosis. Stegonosis is the narrow path of the nerves. But if you have only stegonosis, the endoscopic operation is not allowed. And this is the, the mild cases of stegonosis, but it requires surgery, but the endoscopic surgery is not permitted. For this case, this requires in section, the paralysis is in progress. So to remove the paralysis, the disc is removed, has been removed. And the screw fixation procedures. There are many different types of screw systems. And the artificial discs are in, can be inserted. And some doctors conduct this 
by endoscopic procedure and for the arthrodesis first it looks very good but after a year the bones don't stick so the screw comes apart and requires another procedure this is spinal instability in the neutral position it looks normal but once you move then the flexion is observed then it requires screw system surgery this is scroll scoliosis correction which i major in on the left is the functional scoliosis and the, in the middle is sciatic scoliosis and to the right is the idiopathic scoliosis which is common in children but the serious scoliosis doesn't come with pain so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have pain if you have even if you have serious scoliosis in this case and it may uh, put pressure on the lung and it was recovered to 14 degrees the same person but look different after surgery if you stay in that state then this child can die earlier and also the kyphosis correction there are so many cases of this but let me show you just one case there was a patient with fracture and visited my clinic and we conducted the screw system operation and before after the surgery the angle improved and also for cervical spine surgery if needle procedure doesn't work then you can see the disc has improved the neck bone 567 may be fixed with the screw system and also for the neck disc 54567 five, then the steel plate can be inserted and fixed and for younger patients if they have discs then rather than fixing procedure the artificial disc are uh, may be recommended it may look to be a uh, major surgery but it only takes 30 minutes so to conclude to remove to prevent the uh, back pain there are ways to prevent back pain this is the basic way when you have back pain the pressure varies uh, depending on how you sit on your it, the pressure on the back is greater when you sit and if you lean forward then the pressure increases dramatically the pressure of a soccer ball is 111 and the disc, disc pressure is 1300 so leaning forward is not good for your back but if you do have to lean forward then you can kneel but if you have knee, uh, pain on your knees then you can also change your sitting position to prevent back pain so it may not always be good to work out too much and these are the positions which are good for your back you may want to check those sitting positions and these are the positions which are not good for the back not to it's not very good to sit too upright on, on a chair so just a little you, it's recommended to have a stool for your legs and don't lift objects by leaning forward too much this is wrong way to 
lift things, objects. Bend your knees a little before lifting objects. These are the bad positions for bags, sewing or picking the plants or picking up the golf ball. But this is not very recommended for back pains. Even if professional golfers do this quite a lot, these are good ways for the back movement. But make sure that if you if you find your back pain worsens, then that means that the exercise is not recommended for your for you. So generally, the extra good exercise that are good for back pain. Swimming is good, and walking on the flat ground, and cycling is also good. Or so mount climbing is also recommended. But if you have pains, then stop. So it is very simple, the very important rules. So lastly, we up until before the COVID nineteen outbreak, we our. The employees at my hospital, there are over 100 employees at my hospital. We used to enjoy those extreme sports. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Person Park Won Woo. The spine is very common disease these days, but you shared with us many different cases to prevent back pain. We have some time, so if there are any person with question, you are f free to ask any questions. No question from the floor. Thank you. We have one question. In 2019, I fell on the bathhouse and I hurt my neck as was hurt. So I had stenosis of neck. I tried many different treatment, uh, but I still have convulsion. But listening to your uh, presentation, I should go to your hospital. So I'm wondering if I can completely treat my neck pain. I can say that I can heal you completely, but I have treated so many patients so far. So if you visit my clinic, then I will. I can do any types of procedure. So if you visit my clinic, then I can help you with that pain. Did you get the the needle on your neck? I had the injection and, and shots on my neck and treatment. Did it work one or two days after the injection? No effect? Okay, then you should visit my clinic. Thank you. Thank you. So I is there any one question? I don't have good pronunciation. I have had back pain for a long time now, but my left pelvis recently I cannot keep working for five minutes. So I had reservation in your clinic, but 
it's booked for November. Can I get a get a consultation earlier than that? Okay, I will see to that. Thank you. Yes, yes, you can find me after in person. Thank you. Thank you. You got the appointment today. Thank you. Any more question? So no question. Thank you. Let's give President Park a warm round of applause. Next presenter is Professor Shin Jin Yong from Inje University Haeundae Baek Hospital Colorectal Cancer Department. Please come up to the stage. Professor Shin. completed intern and resident course in Busan National University and currently work as at Inde University Haeundae Baek Hospital. And the subject for presentation today is constipation and colorectal cancer. Please give him a big round of applause. Nice to meet you all. I am in charge of colorectal cancer center at Inde University Haeundae Baek Hospital. Today, I'm going to cover the subject that you suffer a lot, which is constipation. And my expertise, which is colorectal cancer. Let's look at constipation first. So it's not a, an accurate frequency, but 15 to 20 percent out of total population suffer from constipation and if one gets 60 or older 33 percent of people suffer the symptom so what how can we define constipation then if one def defecates less than three times per month then it is constipation so on the right side you can see pictures so on the top and the second picture, if you defecate these type of feces two times per week, not month, per week, then it's constipation. And you can see different types of feces in the image. Females suffers more from constipation and it is related to activity level and amount of food intake. And we can uh, categorize constipation into primary and secondary constipation. Primary constipation is there when there is no uh, disease in the organ and in case of secondary constipation, when there is something wrong in the anatomy, such as colorectal cancer or so, then we categorize it into the secondary constipation. So in order to prevent constipation, we can do these kind of thing. You should eat fibers a lot and refrain from eating processed food. As shown on the slide, the sitting position, the bottom at the center, the green posture is good for you to solve constipation. As mentioned, there is a primary constipation when it is not, not related to anatomy. Then as mentioned, changing or controlling nutritional intake or activity level that affects constipation and colorectal movements and anorectal function are related to the secondary constipation what's the cause of the secondary constipation then so as you can see on the right the large intestine 
if the movement of the large intestine gets slower and decreases, then it is very difficult to move the feces down. So that's why constipation develops. Or when cologne movement decreases, the time for the feces to get the down, to get out, will be delayed. So that's why constipation develops. And anorectal ability to push also affects primary constipation. So all the complications that may develop out of constipation are shown on the slide, such as hemorrhoids, anal fissure, and you need to push with a lot of pressure when you remove your vowel, then rectal bleeding or rectal seal may develop. So on the third photo, it's the picture that shows fecal impaction. And lastly, so it's not common to Korean people Sometimes uh, constipation may lead to diverticular disease of cologne. Let's look at the relation between constipation and colorectal cancer. First thing first, chronic constipation doesn't mean that there is a high possibility of having colorectal cancer. The Let's look at the risk factors to cologne cancer. There are some risk factors that patients can change, such as uh, obesity, physical activity, nutritional intake, or diet habits are the things that patients can change to lower the possibility of cologne cancer. And sometimes, as a symptom of colorectal cancer, one may have constipation. If one finds constipation to last for about one to two months, which didn't exist in the past, then you may get a checkup for colorectal cancer. So the incident rate of colorectal cancer in Korea the fourth highest incident rate was from colorectal cancer. In female, now in 2019, it's the third, and for the male, it's also the third. So if you see the country's ranking, the incident rate of colorectal cancer worldwide currently Korea rank number one, which is not good. So whenever I give explanation to patients at our hospital, when I have to describe the structure of large intestine, I categorize it into cologne and rectum. The rectum is close to the anus, the last part of the large intestine. And that part is called rectum. And within your abdomen, the large intestine that is placed there is called cologne. So let's see the pro progress of colorectal cancer. When one is diagnosed, around 10% of patients are di 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 diagnosed at an initial stage. And 33% when one is diagnosed, then they are found out to have localized disease without any lymph node metastasis. And that's stage two. And when that is, there is metastasis, then one gets diagnosed with stage three. But after the treatment, colorectal cancer can be treated, and the treatment rate is very good. If you see the symptoms, asymptomatic patients are most common. Or for some patients with symptoms, we can see bowel movement, have a change in the bowel habits, anemia, bloody stool, abdominal pain, and so on. There are some preceding diseases to colorectal cancer. As you may well know, colon polyp 
uh, polyp and adenomatous matrices are different. So the polyp are look like that clot on the picture. But in case of adenomatosis, then there is proliferative and non-proliferative. So as you can see on the picture, then if you leave this to grow, then this can develop into colorectal cancer. So let's look into screening tests. Unfortunately, if the endoscope can find all the colorectal can cases, then it's good, but the national the government supports only 50 and above screening tests. So for the younger generation, we do fecal occult blood tests. But to tell you the truth, in order to find the colorectal cancer, doing fecal occult blood test is not enough. So in many cases, the patients have done fecal local blood test before and it was okay, but they find out to have colorectal cancer because the test result wasn't uh, accurate. So as mentioned, if the family history exists, then you should get a checkup or when you have polyps or adeno adenomatosis, then you should get a checkup. Or in case you have breast or endometrial cancer, then you belong to high risk group. So the usual checkup that we do is colonoscopy. The problem with the colonoscopy is that the patient has to drink four milliliter, four liter of that medicine before doing colonoscopy to re evacuate the bowel. So the patient feels it very difficult to do it. So it's a downside of colonoscopy. It only takes about five to 20 minutes, so it's okay, but the process is very difficult. So diagnosis method, number one is CT. We see whether there is metastasis to liver or other parts of the organs. So another method is in case it is related to rectal, then we do MRI. Or we do PET-CT, full body scan. Then PET-CT can identify some metastasis that is not identified during CT or an MRI. Let's see survival rate by stage of colorectal cancer. Stage one, if the patient is stage one, then the survival rate is 90% and above. The, so the five-year survival rate is very high, and it is really, really rare that stage one patient have recurrence and die because of that. So stage two, again, the survival rate is high. Stage three, it's okay. But in case of stage two C and stage three C, the cases are different. So stage four patients, the survival rate for the long term is around five to 10%. If metastasis happen to liver or lung, then the percentage go up. As you can see on the picture on the right, if one has cancer in that part, we can do resection on the right colon. And when one ha if one has cancer on the left side, then we can do left colon resection. So this shows the surgery scope or surgery area. If one develops cancer in the transverse colon, then we do surgery there. And if one has cancer near the anus, then when before in the past, we did abdominal resection. But nowadays, we do not do that because we need to leave the anus as it is. 
So many patients are worried about whether they can ha live or re whether they should remove their anus because of the erectile cancer. Because if they do abdominal perineal resection, then their body will change. And after even after the surgery, they may have some uh, change in bowel habits, such as constipation or diarrhea. And for male patients, there can be decreased sexual function or renation function. In case of colorectal cancer, we do anal sprinter preservation nowadays. So on the right picture, that kind of medical device is used during the surgery in order to do anal sprinter preservation. In case of colorectal cancer, I mentioned that one of the symptoms is constipation or abdominal pain. And if that develops further, then some patients are diagnosed with obstructive colorectal cancer. So 20% of the patients have that symptom. We do insert stents in the part they have obstructive colorectal cancer to do surgery. In the past, as you can see on the left, we did open surgery. And after the surgery, patient has to live with that mark. But nowadays, we do laparoscopic surgery. So the mark, surgery mark, is only about four centimeter. In case of single incision laparoscopic surgery, so I mainly do this method. We do laparoscopy at a really limited area near the belly button, at the belly button. So we don't leave any surgery mark because we use the belly button to insert the laparoscopic device. So we sometimes do robot arm surgery. So as you can see on the bottom right, the physician sit in front of the console box to operate. We do this for rectal surgery, cologne surgery. After the surgery, we do adjuvant treatment such as chemotherapy and radiation therapy. In case of radiation therapy, we do it uh, before the surgery. When we decide that it is difficult to do a surgery because of many reasons, then we do radiation before. And for chemotherapy, we do after the surgery to reduce possible recurrence after radical surgery. The side effects of anti-cancer drug include vomiting, diarrhea, decrease in the number of white blood cells. Then let's say the colorectal cancer develops into metastasis. Unlike other cancer, even though colorectal cancer transferred to other organ, it is okay if one or two organs are affected by, affected by metastasis, then it is okay because we can do surgery immediately. Then the survival rate for those patients stands at about 30 to 40 percent for the longer term. In case of recurrence, so mainly the recurring patient can be found within five year term. Sometimes there can be patients who suffer from recurrence after five years. And liver and lung are the most common sites of recurrence or metastasis. Let's see five year survival rate. The number is kind of outdated, but still 
in Korea, the rate was 70%, but currently it went up. Then it was 70%, but now, as I know of, it is higher than 75%. So across the world, Korea ranks top number one in terms of survival rate. After doing colorectal surgery, we do early recovery programs such as early ambulation, and we minimize the influid fluid dose and recommend early oral intake so that patients can recover quickly. Patients ask a lot after getting a surgery whether how can whether or how can they eat. So there is no prescribed rule for this. I do medical counseling to my patients or I give recommendation based on my experience and say that there is no set rule for food intake after surgery. But generally, it is recommended to have more protein intake for two to three weeks immediately after surgery. And you should eat various uh, nutrients and eat small portion frequently and eat slowly and eat a lot, drink a lot of water. So about exercising. So for one or two months immediately after surgery, you should eat soft and easily digestible food. And after that period, you can uh, eat when you, according to your habit, but I recommend you to see a doctor and uh, get some counseling on this. So screening recommendation. We recommend a screening test for 50 and above, and when you have family history, then it is recommended for you. Thank you. This Professor Shin Jin Yong pre introduced us to the presentation on constipation and colorectal cancer. And he mentioned that the incident rate for colorectal cancer across the globe, Korea stands high. And the screening test can identify early stage colorectal cancer, so I really recommend you to take one. Was it helpful for you? Professor Shin, thank you once again. Please wait. We will receive questions from the floor. If none, then we will end this presentation. Thank you. Now we have the fifth presentation. For this presentation, I will invite Professor Kim hyun yeol from Yangsan Busan University Hospital. Professor Kim hyun yeol graduated from Busan University Medical School and earned doctor's degree from Busan National University Hospital and the general director of the Bu Ul Kyung Breast Cancer Research Association. The title is the number one cancer for women, breast cancer, from prevention to treatment. Thank you for your kind introduction. I'm Kim Hyun Young from Yangsan Busan National University Hospital. My topic today is the breast cancer, which is the number one cancer for women. As you can see, since 2000, the 10 leading cause of death was the cancer. Cancer was the number one cause of death. And for it's a little different between men and women. Since 2016, the breast cancer uh, surpassed thyroid cancer. The thyroid cancer, the breast cancer is more commonly observed these days, especially in Korea. Those in their 50s or 50s, the breast cancer is most common in their in the peak of their uh, people's lifetime in their 50s or 40s or 50s. So my topic today is the breast cancer today. The contents are as follows. The cause of breast cancer, risk factors, symptoms, diagnosis, 
disease period and category and treatment and the prevention. This is the, there are 15 or 20 loaves and there are nipples, the fatty tissues and the armpit, lymph node, it has, there are many causes that, reasons that causes breast cancer. The malign benign tumor is not very serious, but for malign tumor, that's cancer. Then what's tumor? Tumor is the proliferation, abnormal proliferation of cells. If it's benign tumor, then you may have the lump, so it does not pose any threat to our body. But it's, if it's a malign tumor, then the lump invades the surrounding organs and it destroys other organs. That's why we call cancer dangerous. Many patients who come visit me, the most frequently asked questions is, how did I develop breast cancer? Then my answer to them, there are many factors not just one or two causes for breast cancer, then we can prevent it. But unfortunately, there are so many causes. And of them, so hereditary history, family history, age, hormone, environment, dietary and lifestyle, obesity, and radiology. So breast cancer can develop from a combination of different factors. So we cannot prevent just single out one or two factors. If you have family history, 5 or 10 percent is accounted for by breast cancer. And hereditary breast cancer is 0.5 percent. And family history of breast cancer, 2 percent. The BRCA1 is known as the genetics for breast cancer, but other genetics are not directly related to breast cancer at the moment. The risk of breast cancer rises if your one of your family had breast cancer. If you your direct family had breast cancer, then you are more likely to develop breast cancer by up to 2.3 times. And if both mom and daughter had breast cancer, then they are 13 times more likely to develop breast cancer. Or some grandmother or aunt had breast cancer, then one you are one and a half times more likely. Every woman has hormones, but some develop can breast cancer and some don't. So this is not the single cause, but the longer you are exposed to female hormone, then you're more likely to have breast cancer, like the earlier menstruations or pregnancies, then it may affect the chances of developing cancer. If you experience the men, uh, menstruation before age of 12, then 1.3% more likely, and menopause after 55, and experienced menstruation for 40 years, then two times more likely to have. And for pregnancies, childbirth before 20 years of age, then 0.8 times. And first childbirth after 30 years of age, then 1.4 times more likely. And no experience of childbirth, then 1.5% more times more likely. And other environmental factors, the environmental hormones, there are so many types of environmental hormones, and it, in, it releases EDCs such as DL dream, or cup noodle containers, and the magnetic field or artificial lightings that causes B vitamin D deficiency and time lag or stress. They are blamed for breast cancer, and also dietary causes. The more you have the more fat you have, the more likely you are to have breast cancer. Actually, in fact, 
the U.S. and Europe had higher rates of breast cancer, but as our dietary habits become more westernized and the breast cancer rate is on the rise, and alcohol has something to do with breast cancer, but no relationship from tobacco. If you experience breast cancer, then they are more likely to have breast cancer. And if you have family history or abnormal abdominal cells, then more up to four times more likely to have breast cancer. And other factors such as obesity or family history, ovarian cancer, then up from two to four percent more likely. Alcohol consumption, early menopause, and uh, early menstruation and early menopause from 1.1 to 1.9 times more likely. Now, the symptoms of breast cancer. Breast cancer mostly doesn't have symptoms, so sometimes it's diagnosed at a later stage, or sometimes lump, skin collapse, nipple collapse, bloody discharge, ulcer, or edema. The lumps are one of the most common symptoms. Then it do it doesn't come with pain. So some people, many people, ignore the pain, uh, feel some lump in their breast. But if it's left unattended, then it can be seen from outside, and the nipple may collapse. The symptoms of breast cancers, if it invades nipples or milk pipe, then it may dis, uh, discrete discharge. Not all discharge indicate breast cancer, but if it blows, then it's likely to be a breast cancer, so you must go to hospital for examination. Then you have this swell or some skin collapse or nipple collapse. Now, diagnosis. First, self-diagnosis and the checkup by professionals and mammography, and breast ultrasound, and fine needle biopsy and tissue examination. Then if you get the diagnosis, then MRI, CT, or PET, or bone scan can be recommended for treatment. Now, the self-diagnosis. You can do this after three or five days after the, after the end of menstruation. When your breast is uh, most soft and you can conduct this on the first day after the menstruation. As you can see in this slide, just stand before the mirror and um, put your hand on your weight and observe your breast. If the two breasts are in balance or is, if there is any collapse observed, then lift your two hands and see where uh, if there are any collapse and then you can Sense the lump with three fingers and and check if there's any discharge or some stain from uh, on the inner wear. And once you're done with the one breast, then you can repeat the same process on the other. This is how you can conduct a tactile examination. There's no. Uh, so set manner but once you do try one sem one method then you can stick to that method the three r finger tactile examination is most recommended when you you can apply butt lotion uh, to sense the lump in your breast this is the mammography to have an x-ray on your breast. For Asians especially, the mammography, 50% of the mammography comes out, uh, turns out no lesions, so ultrasound is recommended at the same time. The upper left photo is the 
oval lump. So, and this is benign sometimes, but on the bottom, some rough shape, it could be cancer. So for mammogram or MRI, if the cancer is suspected, then you can have the tissue examination and there are ways how to do it. First is fine needle cell examination. And the another is using the special using the special needle to take the samples from the breast. Fine needle cell examination is very simple, doesn't come with pain, but the accuracy is not very high, but the the total tissue examination can turn out more accurate results. So this method is preferred these days. This is vacuum assistant breast biopsy. It's usually called mammotomy. It uses the larger needle to cut out the tissues. So it cuts out multiple tissues at, uh, at once. So for smaller lesion, you can remove the lesions, and so it's also used for treatment of tumor. The Korea's Breast Cancer Academy recommends as this: after 30 years of age, a month examination on a monthly basis is recommended. After 35 years, every two years. After 40 years of age, mammography. Uh, once or twice a year or for high-risk groups such as family history then you may want to have consultation more often next is the period the first and secondary and tertiary are the period of the breast disease why do we this to see the expect the prognosis and to come up with a treatment suitable for that period the size and metastasis and the subtypes are the standard to determine the period for breast cancer Breast cancer has good prognosis at the stage O, almost 100% of survival rate and more than 90% for first term and second term and even for third term it's over 75% and fourth term which, the, uh, which is the metastasis, 34% can be cured completely. Now the biological classification of breast cancer People with breast cancer sometimes ask me, is it good, benign, or malign? Actually, there's, this is the classification that divides good or bad. Good. We decide this based on by looking at if it has hurt to or not. So that determines whether we have the hormone receptor positive breast cancer or not. Uh, there are many types, such as uh, first is hormone receptor positive breast cancer and three positive breast cancer and HER2 positive cancer and three negative breast cancer. If the prognosis is good, there's no customized treatment, then you must go to uh, go under chemotherapy and the prognosis is not very good. But the treatments are under development, so I believe the prognosis for this will develop in the future. Now, the treatment. Breast cancer uh, accompanies different treatments, surgery, radiology, and adjuvant drug treatment. First is after different tests, then first operation and chemotherapy or targeted therapy and for prognosis, progressive surgery cancer then after improving the prognosis and then have the chemotherapy 
and for surgery for breast, the total mastectomy. And the other is breast conserving surgery. And for armpit, the axillary lymph node and monitor lymph node biopsy. This is the partial sectomy. The cancer itself is removed, so the breast is preserved. But for total mastectomy, the total area of breast is removed if the size is large and there are many cancer cells. The picture on the right is the total mastectomy, but uh, this is reconstruction that leaves the nipples. And this is the breast preserving surgery. One to two millimeters of the cancerous tissues are removed and it prevents the local recurrence. So it has the, a similar recurrence rate with the total mastectomy. This is conducted on patients who are older or who are not expected to have the good shape of breast, then the total mastectomy is recommended. In the past, the total bisectomy was recommended, but after 2022, the preserving mastectomy are more commonly conducted to ensure the patient's have the minimum level of emotional shocks. The reconstruction. Reconstruction is the surgery uh, uh, after which an artificial structure is inserted to keep the breast shape. This is the breast reconstruction surgery case. Two to three weeks after the surgery, the aid is inserted, but recently the reconstruction is performed at the same time with the breast cancer surgery. Then it's good to keep the breast shape intact after, even after the surgery. And the latissimus dorsi muscle reconstruction operation and the breast reconstruction surgery by using the muscles from ab ab using the abdominal muscles the survival rate is increasing from 30% to 50% and the preserving breast preserving surgery is on the rise from 24% to almost 50% Many patients want to remove the total breast, but preserving the preserving operation is not always as good as partial removal. So you can consult with your surgeon on what surgery to have. This armpit lymph node removal surgery. then the edema or the sensory pain may happen after this surgery. So recently, the sentinel node is conducted where the lymph node is taken out before having this surgery. If they are okay, then the breast cancer lymph uh, sectomy is has decreased. So recently, the breast cancer surgery does not come with causes much of a pain or shocks on patients these days. The complication after breast cancer surgery, 
seroma arm edema or abnormal sensors those complications or side effects are associated with the side effects of lymph node and those side effects or complications can be prevented if unless you have issues with lymph node then chemotherapy is conducted after the surgery to prevent the spread of cell cells even after the total breast cancer uh, breast removal then you can also undergo radiotherapy and sometimes it's recommended to reduce the cells proliferation this is usually conducted three or four weeks after the surgery but for patients who have to go under radiotherapy then radiology chemotherapy and radiotherapy can come with some side effects but uh, side effects are not as serious as the chemotherapy but sometimes the the side effects are not very serious the adjuvant treatment first is the chemotherapy the vomit that which causes vomiting or hair loss this chemotherapy is conducted to kill cancerous cells in your body for breast cancer it's usually conducted to prevent the recurrence after breast cancer surgery almost uh, usually four or six months after the surgery the doses are important so once you start then you should follow until the end there are many drugs these days to reduce the side effects so these days it's not as painful as it used to be the chemotherapy has a lot of side effects because of their or effects the anti-drug anti-cancer drugs kill cells to prevent cell proliferation so it affects normal cells at the same time the cancer cells like hair or blood cells that's why it comes with side effects the side effects the normal cells or bone marrow cells are affected then you may have the reduction of white blood cells and hemorrhage and the hair loss most of the side effects uh, can be cured after the chemotherapy every people has different side effects sometimes suffer serious side effects so they sometimes reduce the doses but they should be consulted with your physician second is anti-hormone treatment it's not usually conducted on other cancers but especially for breast cancer as I told you the female hormone affects breast cancer so drugs prevent the effects from the female hormones so after surgery or chemotherapy tamoxifen anastrozole or letrozole can be taken in for between five to ten years but side effects from anti-hormone treatments it has it may cause facial uh, such as uh, osteoporosis and muscle pain or arthritis but the side effects are not very common so it has great benefits to prevent cancer recurrence if you can take drugs for five to ten years then it means that the side effects are not very serious third is the targeted treatment if HER2 receptor is positive it's only used for HER2 receptor positive these drugs are so expensive 
so the patients can receive those drugs IV or subcutaneously every three weeks for one year but you first need to check if those drugs work for you but it also comes with side effects but not very serious but sometimes it may affect your heart functions but it works very well for cancer and special treatments high dose chemotherapy immune th immunotherapy or cross promotion factor restraint but these are not very commonly used now the management after surgery this uh, these are the recommendations from the u.s national cancer research institute eat as differently as possible eat sufficient amount of fruit and vegetable and refrain from consuming vitamin or fibers Many of the breast cancer patients are younger females, so they, are, they tend to be curious about what to eat after surgery. But for after surgery, you may want to consult with your physician, and it's important to have a balanced diet. For breast cancer affects emotional, your emotion, because uh, the breast becomes uh, loses its original shape so it has some emotional damages and may lead to anxiety anger or frustration confusion or sometimes depression so some patients have emotional treatment but make sure that you live as normally as possible as before but sometimes people around you may help such as the cancer patients meeting or have some consultations with professionals or your primary physician the follow-up examination every it's recommended every six months after the surgery or sometimes every three months For lymph node, lymphedema, if, you, if your arms swell, then low, uh, lift your hand higher than your heart and treat that symptoms with pressure stocking or if that doesn't work then you can consult with your physician. For breast cancer patients then for the arm that had surgery, uh, it's recommended to take extra care on the arms that had the surgery. Now, how to prevent breast cancer? The food that is not recommended is the animal fat. There's no 100% sure way to prevent breast cancer, but make sure that you know what's good or what's bad. The food to avoid, animal fat, the calorie consumption or alcohol, and good foods, the fiber, foods with high amount of fiber. These are not just good for breast cancer, but also good for every people. And for exercise, exercise is recommended all people. Regular exercise will delay the, early, the first menstruation and help reduce body weight. And for dietary habits, keep your normal weight and refrain from intaking fat. And quit drinking. And make sure that you are not exposed to high dose of radiology. And work out for 30 minutes three times every week and regular checkup is recommended and make sure that you have uh, checkup more often if you are at one of the high-risk groups 
my key message is this. Students who are good at school, there's no special way to prevent breast cancer. Only uh, simply the good living tips. Just keep your normal body weight, refrain from drinking alcohol or exercise as possible as you can. They, these are the tips good for the breast cancer. Even if you do these, then you may develop breast cancer, including myself. It's not under our control, even me or you. But the prognosis for breast cancer is very good. Up until the second term, the early detection uh, has more than 90% of treatment. So what's important is to have checkup and early diagnosis. Then at least you will have live healthier life. And this is the recommendations for early checkup. Thank you. These days, breast cancer patients are on the rise, and as a female myself, I see people who develop breast cancer. So I really, I think your presentation was so informative. There are so many technologies to treat breast cancer. And I want to thank Professor Kim hyun Yeol once again. Thank you. Thank you. Breast cancer, the self-diagnosis is recommended, and, but the prognosis is very good for breast cancer. So make sure that you conduct self diagnosis to ensure earlier diagnosis. Now, the final. So the last speaker today is Professor Park Mu In. Please come up to the stage and please give him a big round of applause once again. Thank you. Professor Park Moo-in is currently the professor of Koshin University Gospel Hospital Gastroenterology Department and currently work at the same hospital. And he will make presentation on causes and prevention of gastric cancer. Please give him a big round of applause once again. Good afternoon. The presentation I'm going to make is about causes and prevention of stomach cancer. About the treatment and diagnosis, I'll be brief. Because causes and prevention are not covered well before because and the prevention method should be practiced by everybody. So that's why I'm going to focus on these today. These are the contents of my presentation today. First is how common the stomach uh, cancer is and the causes of stomach cancer. And helicobacter pylori is the major reason. And nutritional habit, which is low salt diet and chronic stomach cancer and atrophic gastritis are the reasons why we suffer from gastric cancer. So these are the symptoms that may lead or disease that may lead to gastric cancer. So I'll talk about the prevention methods also. So helicobacter pylori eradication treatment can be one and quit drinking and smoking and aspirin intake can be one way to prevent gastric cancer. There is an ongoing research on this, so I'll introduce it to you. As other cancers for gastric cancer, early diagnosis is also important. 
So early diagnosis and screening tests provided by the government is conducted in Korea and also in Japan. And these two countries are the only two countries that provide such screening by the country. And for a high risk group, who has family history or so, one time a year screening is recommended. What's the most important thing here is that early diagnosis may lead to complete recovery. So I'll emphasize on that later on. First is about the incident rate of or incidence of gastric cancer. As you can see, Korea, Japan, ranked high compared to the US or UK. In case of male, out of 100,000 people in Korea, it is around 296 males, and in Japan, it is around 328 males. But these are not cons limited to Korea and Japan. In the US and the UK, in the past, like in the 1970s, were, the, were very high, but Nowadays, it, the number dropped significantly, so we have done a lot of research on the reason why. And one of the possible reasons is because of change diet. So, and refrigerator, the development of refrigerator contributed to the change diet. In the past, we marinated in salt to preserve for a long time. But in the United States, due to the development of refrigerator, people don't have to preserve it or marinate it in salt to preserve. So that's why the gastric cancer incidence dropped. It was a dilemma in a Korean physicians and researchers on how we can handle this high number to drop. So if we look into the incidents more in detail, in by 2012, the number increased steadily, but from 2011 and 12 to then on, then the number started to drop. It is a very welcoming news for us. So I'll explain to you this aspect in more in detail. In case of female, gastric cancer incidence is very high in Korea. The number is lower than, lower than that of male, but it's still very high. So for male and female, both Korea rank the highest in terms of gastric cancer incidence across the world. However, according to the latest data, if you see the number of 2019 and 2020, the number dropped from 40 to 50 out of 100,000 to significantly lower number. So if we continue this trend, we will be able to lower this number to less than five hour out of 100,000. So let's see the causes and why could stomach cancer develop. There are various types of stomach cancer. Let's see the most common type, which is intestine-related stomach cancer. We've done a lot of animal tests and uh, did some uh, investigation. So this is the table that we made based on such research. This table shows all related factors to gastric cancer. Helicobacter pylori is the most common reason and it the number with uh, the burn number is 2.5 times higher than for other reasons so for smoking the number is 1.6 times higher for drinking 1.4 times higher than normal so these are how prevalent it is for people with these kind of living habits to develop gastric cancer so period of drinking period of 
smoking, if the more number of cigarettes you smoke, then the possibility of developing gastric cancer increase as well. If you see the table, there is marinated vegetables again because it is related to salt intake and the number is 1.28 times higher. So these ta this table is made based on the research on the factors related to gastric cancer made so far. And lastly, the pink one is meat intake. And there is another research that, that, uh, that is opposite to the, this meat intake number. So this is kind of controversial. So. Things that we can do to prevent gastric cancer is on the left side. First is Helicobacter pylori infection, positive and negative. And second, what's important is exercise. Here we say physical activity, and it is not just limited to gastric cancer. Various, in order to prevent various cancer, physical activity is very recommended. And you need to walk at a fast pace for more than four hours within one week in order to prevent various cancers and to prevent cardiovascular diseases as well. This has been proven by statistics and scientific research. Next is fruit and vegetable intake. intake. These two can uh, contribute to preventing uh, gastric cancer. It's not just about for one or two days. You need to sustain this kind of eating habits for your entire life. And drinking green tea regularly can contribute to prevention. And caffeine, as for other cancer, there are some research that point out that caffeine can contribute to decreasing the prevalence of developing cancer. But in case of gastric cancer, it's kind of vague. It's not proven yet. So we need to watch, see, and fish intake because we are living in Busan. Peop, uh, researchers think that the fish intake may positively influence the uh, prevalence of gastric cancer, but it is not proven uh, solidly yet. So I'll sh I'm not going to share endoscope photos today, but I'll explain to you about precancerous lesions of gastric cancer, which is astropic, gastritis, and intestinal epithelial metaplasia. You have may have heard very frequently about helicobacter pylori infection which can be chronic and more acute and sometimes you might have been diagnosed with atrophic gastritis in case of helicobacter pylori for around 40 years we have conducted a lot of research on helicobacter pylori and we found out that five years old or lower can be infected by Helicobacter pylori, which live in our uh, lung for, or stomach for the entire life. As you can see on the slide, it may lead to acute or chronic infection, but 90% of these cases may lead to nothing. So. So asymptomatic infection of Helicobacter pylori leads to 90% of asymptomatic infection. But in case of enteral gastritis, most common symptom is nothing, asymptomatic infection. But sometime in some cases, it may develop into maltriformer, which is a limp tumor. And atrophic gastritis is a rare case. Even though one has that atrophic gastritis, it leads to asymptomatic infection in most cases, but so you don't have to worry about it. But it may lead to stomach ulcer or intestinal epithelium. 
Intestinal epithelium is when the cell of intestine turns into a cell of stomach. So it may lead to atypia, then lead again to gastric cancer. So the high risk group in terms of age is in people in their 40s and 50s. But 1% or lower population among all those helicobacter pylori infected patients may lead to stomach cancer. There is no clear way we can prevent the intestinal epithelial metaplasia, but if you cure helicobacter pylori infection and if you quit drinking, smoking, and to eat food with low salt and change your eating habit, then you can uh, prevent further progress. It is proven by animal testing, so even though you may have intestinal epithelial metaplasia, you don't have to worry too much because if you change your eating habits and lifestyle, then it can be cured. Endoscopy is recommended once a year in order to diagnose atypia or early stage gastric cancer. If it is found at an early stage, then we can uh, treat it and cure it 100%. So please follow what's recommended by your doctor and by the hospital. You don't have to worry too much. Then a prevention method include low salt diet, quitting drinking, smoking, and helicobacter pylori eradication treatment and aspirin. It is difficult to say that aspirin is effective for gastric cancer for 100 percent or all these factors have positive influence but I'll show the chart here which indicate that there is a positive impact we do nutritional intake survey in Korea for all people and we do an oral survey or document-based survey to Korean people to see how much fiber and protein, cholesterol, calcium, and so on they take. So if you see this chart starting from 2010 to 2020, it's the average number. So you can see that there, the eating habits and their diet, people's diet is re has influence over gastric cancer. So if you see the salt intake, we had two times higher salt intake compared to what's recommended by the government. But as you can see from the blue bar, the salt intake is decreasing. And these trends contributed to lower the incidence of gastric cancer. So change in people's diet and changing traditional way of Korean food intake can be positive in preventing gastric cancer. And second, in Korea, there is a significant decrease in the prevalence of helicobacter pylori infection. So the recent data has the higher number than this, but if we survey the entire Korean people with helicobacter pylori, in Seoul it was 65% in the past, like in 1988, but in 2011 that dropped to 50. So it's almost the same as other advanced country in terms of people in their 20s. So for a younger generation, the prevalence of a gastric cancer can be lower than before. Let's find out the reason why. I think that's because of the economic growth of the country. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, when the economic status was not that good, people Family members gathered in, live in one room, and the sanitation and hygiene were not good at the time. But as the national economy grew, the live lifestyle has changed. So that's why the 
statistics on the prevalence of Helicobacter pylori infection decrease. Helicobacter pylori infection is not transmitted among adults, but the infection is transmitted from adult to children, such as from mother to ch child or grandmother, grandfather to child. And let's say male and female meet at when, after being an adult, and if one asks whether Helicobacter pylori will be transmitted or not, I can say that there is no transmission among a spouse because among adults it is not transmitted. So I'll talk about the importance of early diagnosis from now on. This will be the last portion of my presentation. In case of gastric cancer, if we diagnose it early, then we can do endoscope, uh, gastroscopy and do resection. As mentioned, we have can do robot arm surgery and laparoscopy. And after this kind of surgery, then uh, the cancer can be cured 100%. So except for Japan, Korea is the only one country with this highest number uh, with the um, government-supported screening for gastric cancer. So it began in 1990s. So as you can see, from 2002 to 2019, this is the participation rate in endoscopy. When it first introduced, the number was 31.2%, but most recently, 89.1% participated in the screenings. So we can say that almost a high number of, or almost all Korean people participated in this. This is very encouraging. More than 80% is receiving it. And we are among the only one or two countries that provide this kind of screening by the country. And the death rate out of gastric cancer dropped thanks to this screening. So the incidence rate in 1999, it was 45.66, and it dropped to 30.8 in 2019. If we compare the number to the United States, it's higher because the United States is five. But if we look out to 10 years from now, then the number will further drop, and we will be able to match that number of the US. So if you see the mortality rate in 1999, it was 29.4, and it dropped to 8.3. The reason is because of the early diagnosis. The biggest reason is that early diagnosis. And second is the development of surgery method of gastric cancer. It has advanced a lot. The physicians, Korean physicians' performance is very high. It's number one across the globe. So I showed you the number. If we give you, if I give you too much number, I'll show it can be complicating. So I'll give you just one table. The survival rate of gastric cancer for Korea is 68.9 percent, and Japan is 60.3 percent. It is a very objective data. And the US and the UK is like half of our number. So this shows that we have high number for the incidence because we find the cancer cases at an early stage. But if you can take into account the surgery performance, the survival rate is very high for our country. And compared to Japan, we are 10% higher in terms of survival rate. And that this record will only go up from now on. And this is the summary and conclusion of my presentation. In Korea, the incidence of gastric cancer is still high, but the trend is decreasing over the past 10 years. Various factors are involved but food and helicobacter infection are the main causes. 
and that also includes smoking, drinking, and eating habits that include a lot of salt intake, but the eating habit is changing into low salt diet, so the incidence is constantly decreasing. In case of atrophic gastritis and intestinal epithelial metaplasia, even though you are diagnosed with these two, you don't have to worry because it can uh, get better after correcting food and lifestyle. Uh, quitting uh, cigarette, quitting drinking is recommend or recommended for prevention. And we are doing a research on aspirin, the use of aspirin. After five years, we will be able to see whether aspirin is recommended. So, and Helicobacter pylori infection eradication treatment is recommended. So after five years, we will be able to see. In Japan, Japan recommend 100% tre uh, eradication treatment for Helicobacter patients. And as for aspirin, aspirin has the efficacy to prevent cancer, and it has been proven by the US researchers. And then people think that it may have efficacy on gastric cancer as well. And also for this, we have ongoing research. After the research proves that it is or it has positive impact, then you will be able to use aspirin for gastric cancer. Even though one has gastric cancer, the it is most commonly asymptomatic, so you need to get checkup every year or once in two years and get an endoscopy. Lastly, Early diagnosis lead to full recovery, so please remember this. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Park Muin covered gastric cancer and prevention. So in Korea as well, the prevalence of gastric cancer compared to the past got better. I think that's because of the efforts and contribution of professors like you. Once again, please give him a big round of applause. Thank you. So today from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock, we invited six top-notch physicians in Busan and heard lectures from them. I would like to thank all our online and offline participants for listening through. And I am Kang Yun Ha, CEO of medical device company that provides total care for female diseases. This concludes the lecture section of Busan International Medical Tourism Convention. Thank you.